The frontline story here is how a coach, a ferret, and a pesticide transformed my world. The backstory, to be spelled out in the epilogue, is how vulnerability and presence can change the world of science and medicine. Research as experienced by the researcher and illness as experienced by the ill and those providing their care. To do that, and to begin in the form of a prologue, we need to go back to the 1980s when a new college grad was lucky enough to give a talk at a national meeting. I apparently gave a rather bold talk. I tried to integrate my college thesis on stress and fear in the brain with the rapid pumping of the heart during fight or flight. During the question and answer period, a professor ran to the microphone and proceeded to scold me publicly. First for misquoting him, but more importantly for what I was wearing and for the casual yet spirited way that I gave my talk. He then ran from the room furious. Me, well, I was terribly embarrassed. I was confused. I wondered for some time why the scientific community seemed so averse to bold, averse to risky, averse to exuberant engagement. <laughs> I wondered, perhaps, if it had something to do with the comfort of hiding behind data or a fear of being wrong. I later experienced a similar objectification of patients, seemingly an homage of the science of medicine and the increasing technology of clinical care, with doctors sitting behind computers checking off boxes to satisfy medical and billing algorithms. The sad effect of this, though, it has forced doctors to not fully engage deeply in the raw experience of illness and death. So with these two stories as emotional triggers for precisely how we should strive not to be, let's dive in to how we might transform our human connections by introducing you to the coach, the ferret, and the pesticide, our frontline story. To do that, we'll need to fast forward to a bit to right here, right now. I'm the director of the Adrenal Cancer Program at the University of Michigan. Adrenal cancer forms in this little guy, the adrenal gland that makes a bunch of stress hormones that we study. Adrenal cancer is one of the rarest and deadliest cancers we know. While Michigan has become a leading center in the world for this disease, back in 99 when I started here, we could barely even field half a team to tackle or wrestle this beast. But it turns out we had a coach, and that was Bo Schembechler, Michigan football icon. Bo's wife, Millie, died of adrenal cancer a few years earlier. The problem was that most doctors had never seen a case. And if they had, it didn't matter because no one even knew what to do. Bo was pissed. And he, he vowed to change that. And he became the toughest advocate ever, always demanding answers, and he pushed hard. Well, eventually, he raised money to create this one-of-a-kind program that focused exclusively on adrenal cancer from research at the bench to care at the bedside. What Bo did for me personally, however, is not as simple as that. Eyes fixed, ears transfixed. No bullshit, no apologies for risk, success, failure. Namaste. For Bo, it didn't matter what you did. Plumber, football star, doctor, unemployed, it was irrelevant. What mattered is who you were. What Bo reawakened in me was that bold exuberance and a permission to engage deeply with people in the clinic and to be forever curious, almost restless in the laboratory. So let's do that. We dove deep into the biology of adrenal cancer, and we came curiously to the domesticated ferret. Pet ferrets are neutered, and when you do that, they develop adrenal cancer every time. That caught the attention of a talented student who noticed that the same thing happened in mice with a curious twist. Brendan removed the testicles of some male mice and watched in amazement as the adrenal gland literally started to transform into bona fide female ovaries in real time before becoming hormone-producing cancers. Okay. This sounded like blasphemy, but Brendan, fearless. 
fearless of failure, criticism, it didn't matter. He masterfully teased apart the defect that allowed for this apparent trick of nature. And in so doing, he literally stumbled into the stem cells of the adrenal gland. These stem cells, the green ones here, they sit on the outside of the gland, and they serve to make new hormone cells for the adrenal as cells die throughout life. Now, that's the normal job of a stem cell. But what Brendan did was link a stem cell defect to cancer, OK? As he described how a single gene was responsible for the reprogramming of an adrenal to an ovary to cancer. For me, I saw in Brendan that guy I was 15 years before. The lesson, be fearless. Work on problems that are difficult and risky enough that you might fail. And don't be afraid of that. All right, what about the pesticide? 1948, the Nobel Prize is given for the discovery of the pesticide DDT. To say it was used widely is an understatement. <laughs> 1959. After being shown to be toxic to the dog adrenal, a derivative of DDT, mitotane, becomes the first ever and still the only approved drug for adrenal cancer in the world. DDT, on the other hand, almost single-handedly ignites the environmental movement and is banned in 72. Millie Schembechler was treated with mitotane, and we had to do better. Okay. So along with the ferret, that's how our work began here. We studied the adrenal stem cell, and we found that the genes we studied in mice were the same exact genes mutated in patients with adrenal cancer. Moreover, the funding for these early and pivotal studies was provided exclusively by family and friends of our own patients. And that, it turns out, was the game changer. The internet was booming. People started educating themselves online. They would call. They would come to see us from as far away as Australia, Africa, even China. And a number of these people would become a fierce band of adrenal cancer warriors. From legislation to fundraising to advocacy to awareness, you name it, they did it. And I'm going to tell you about two of them. And a passion man calls me one day and asks how he might help fight the fight. For Tim, we talked for hours. Healthcare, economics to legislation, fundraising to research. For this guy, Tim, can was clearly the operative word. He was a doer, and I like that. So we plan to like change the world. One day in my office, Tim casually asked me to look at a couple of CT scans. Unknown to me, they were his. Tim was suffering from the worst case of adrenal cancer I had ever seen. I reflexively switched gears to doctor mode. I talked subjectively about his case. Chemotherapy, radiation, data, numbers, facts. After a brief stint home in Colorado, Tim flew himself back to Michigan in hopes of a miracle we didn't have. And I learned then, to my horror, that no one had ever told Tim how ill he was. And that's when that doctor-patient thing, it simply melted away. I, I found myself identifying with Tim the patient, yes, but increasingly Tim the man, Tim the husband, Tim the father. After two or three weeks in our hospital, the job became mine to tell this man who never said no that there was nothing more I could do, and it was time to send him home. Later in the day, I walked into that sterile room. I looked Tim in the eye and told him he was dying. I unexpectedly broke down in sobs of grief. I, I cried for Tim. I cried for his children. I, I cried, it seemed, for everyone. And remarkably, in that hospital room, Tim's own family then comforted me in my grief. In that moment, I changed. I knew then and there that I would never, ever hide the truth of me from patients, from people again. That was eight years ago. 
I'll need us to fast forward one more time to about two years ago when a fellow colleague at Michigan now calls me and tells me his wife has adrenal cancer. Riley was a PhD scientist who had worked at the old Park Davis and then ironically on rare diseases. Riley was treated with mitotain and like Millie got little benefit. After becoming increasingly discouraged, she now shows up in my office one day, looks me in the eye, and tells me that she herself is going to find a drug that finally works in this dreadful disease. Well, with hesitation, reservation, trepidation, I say, OK, and I watch. As she then takes medical leave and begins to collaborate in the laboratory of her husband and her doctor, me. Just a tad unconventional, perhaps, and so much, by the way, for trying to maintain boundary between doctor and patient. Riley survived only two and a half years. But in this brief time, she somehow actually did find a drug that killed adrenal cancer. She co-founded a company to bring that drug to market. She helped raise $16 million to make that happen and got the FDA to approve a clinical trial that right now is ongoing in people at Michigan. <laughs> Riley died. Riley died seven mere days before that drug was made available to her. This altruism is mind boggling. Riley was empowered to change the world. She changed mine. Okay. Now, like Bo and Tim, you might ask, was it wrong that Riley was first my patient and then advocate, researcher, collaborator, and ultimately my friend? The answer, of course, is a resounding no. And here's why. Told in the form of our epilogue to the story of the coach, the ferret, and the pesticide. To hear the words, you have cancer, is terrifying. This truth revealed fractures our reality. It challenges our relationship to our inner world and our engagement with the outer. Embedded within this impossible journey, however, is an actual gift, a strange gift that is not just for the ill, but for everyone. All you need to receive this rare communion, our vulnerability and presence, our backstory. As a doctor who takes care of many people who die, I am thankful for the wisdom unveiled to me by these men and women in this, their most vulnerable and inner sanctuary. In this place of finding themselves dying, brave people have let me into their space where three truths seem to be unveiled again and again as defining gifts of sacredness. These truths can be, can be embraced as three reflections of the actual word, presence. Presence, conscious engagement, the experience of present time, and emotional authenticity. With these people, I have come to feel, I've come to know, that if we have time when we are ill, time before we die, and we are brave enough, what happens as our vanity, our beauty, and ultimately our physical identity is stripped away is we are granted a chance to become our own sacredness as it becomes all that is left. Sadly, when people die, suddenly they rarely have the gift of such time, such a place. Even more tragic is that most of us, we never dare, we never risk to venture to this vulnerable place while living when we do have time. For me, this vulnerable place is simply a state of mindfulness which in the context of these thoughts here, as strange as it may sound, ends up meaning to die before we die. 
having our death close by, be it through illness or conscious reflection, sharpens our internal lens by stripping away all that is not present, all that is not presence. It is indeed my experience with these deeply reflective and engaged people that is becoming for me a touchstone for such conscious intent. Bo, Tim, Riley, and now countless others. That unique bond between doctor and patient is often described as a polarized one. Patient asks, doctor answers. Doctor gives, patient takes. This is just silly. Trusting comes when each feel the presence of the other and hence know the truth of the other. So I now reject the dichotomy that implies that we must disengage to provide objective care or do objective science. It was that dichotomy that rejected me so many years ago. Cold and impersonal. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. On the contrary, conscious and emotional engagement not only facilitates healing and acceptance in the ill, it opens up a space in the caregiver as well. And in that vulnerable space where spirit mingles, life is transformed for the suffering and life is transformed for those who bear witness. The Hippocratic Oath decrees do no harm, but it also speaks to personal integrity. We must not be wrapped in solitary ego, filled with the imposter syndrome, afraid of being found out that we are not all-knowing but are fallible. A good doctor, indeed a good scientist, knows what he or she doesn't know and discloses it. It's not afraid of it. Discloses it with humility. Owning our limitations is freeing and it honors our shared humanity. Student, teacher, patient, caregiver, scientist, mystic. We are all of these. So I urge us all to be present, consciously engaged, emotionally authentic, and living in that razor-sharp now, because that's how we can change the world.